Okay, so if you're interested in uh, in some of these ideas, the book on the left is the non-technical version uh, explaining uh, how to, how we think about AI and how to fix this problem of control over systems more intelligent than us. Uh, the right is the textbook, which has uh, lots of uh, meaty stuff about AI, but the fourth edition incorporates this new way of thinking about what we should be doing. Next slide. Okay, so so that's it. Um, there's enormous potential upside, uh, but also uh, I would say sort of infinite downside if we create systems that we can no longer control. Uh, even if we do solve that problem, and I believe we can solve it, uh, it's still not clear how we coexist satisfactorily with systems more intelligent than us. Uh, and you can see this problem in science fiction that it, even if you look at the sort of utopias, right, um, they have a very hard time figuring out what human beings are going to do and what purpose humans have in life when the AI systems exceed us uh, in every dimension. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Russell. Um, I, uh, I'll start with, with some questions from the floor that are coming in. Um, so one question is about um, the way you, you laid out uh, the setting of objectives and making it more human compatible. Um, the question is whether it's sufficient to give the AI program the, the right objectives uh, that are then benevolent to humans. Um, and is it actually conceivable to appropriately constrain the means to reach those objectives? Uh, good question. So I, I don't think it's possible for us to write down the objectives. And I think this is this is the important point. We call this the King Midas problem, right? Because King Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. That was the objective that he stated. And of course, it didn't work because his then he couldn't eat and he couldn't drink and he couldn't touch his family members without everything turning to cold. Um, and, and we see this with AI systems over and over again, actually. Uh, you know, and sometimes they're funny uh, when we think we've specified an objective. Um, my favorite example is, is uh, a, a project on simulated evolution. And they, they wanted to evolve um, locomotion. And so they they set the fitness function to be what's the maximum speed of translation of the center of mass of the object. Right? And they thought that <clears throat> they would involve little legged objects that would run around very fast or something like that. What they actually evolved <clears throat> were um, trees that grew 100 kilometers tall and then fell over. And in falling over, their center of mass would move very fast. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it sort of optimized the objective, but it completely wasn't what they wanted. Uh, so it's really, really hard to specify objectives. And if you think about it uh, <clears throat> more generally, right, you, you're asking humans to write down a preference ranking over lotteries over futures of the universe, uh, which obviously is, is not feasible. Uh, and so anything you try to do if you write it down wrong, then you're setting up a chess match, right? Now you've got a system that's pursuing an objective that isn't the future that you want. Uh, so you're automatically in conflict. Um, and there's, if it's more intelligent than you, it will succeed and you will fail. Uh, and, uh, and you lose that chess match. So, uh, so we want systems that know that they don't know what the objective is and, and the rational way for those systems to behave is, is first of all, to try to learn more about what humans want, to infer as much as possible from human behavior, from you know, the textual record, from the structure of our civilization, all of which carry <clears throat> huge amounts of information about our preference structures. Um, but also, as they know that they don't know a lot about our preference structures, they will be much more cautious. Right? They will they will avoid changing the parts of the world where they don't know what, what we want that part of the world to be like. Um, and, and that's another mathematical theorem about their behavior uh, that oh. we, well, um, 
So, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you, I mean, many of us on, on the call probably first time we're exposed to AI uh, with with these large language models that you you touched on, but but beyond that. Um, as you explained, AI is such so much uh, a much bigger field. What are some of the emerging trends you see in AI, and, and in particular, what are sort of recent breakthroughs in, in the field that you are particularly exciting about? Um, good question. I see that I didn't quite answer the second part of the last question. Uh, is it conceivable to constrain the means to reach those objectives? Hmm. Yes, that's a direction that is being pursued by some researchers uh, that instead of optimizing uh, one thing is quantalizing where you you know you try to achieve just the 75th percentile uh, of of the objective rather than the 100th percentile uh, and it has some good properties but it still suffers from uh, from bugs and i think the the assistance game uh, at least as a theoretical formulation is, is probably the right one um Okay, sorry, I, I now I've distracted myself. Um, the 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 things that are going on right now. Uh, there's two trends. So one is to say, well, look, we're very excited by the large language models and what they're able to do, but they exhibit a number of weaknesses. And so far, we found that by making them bigger, uh, we eliminate some of those weaknesses. So let's just keep making them bigger. And this is, you know, they use words like scaling laws as if this was some physics principle that, you know, that this will necessarily solve all the problems. This is purely an empirical observation. There's no theory behind scaling laws whatsoever. Um, and you can imagine two things happening, right? So uh, just to make a very simple analogy, suppose that, um, uh, we wanted to solve the game of Go by building a lookup table, right? Well, the full-size game of Go with a 19 by 19 board has about 10 to the 170 positions. Um, so we let's start with a smaller Go board. Let's start with two by two Go, right? I can build a lookup table of that, and now I'm really happy, right? And it that lookup table doesn't play a good game on a three by three board, so I'll scale it up. I'll build a bigger lookup table, and now I can play three by three Go, right? And then I need, you know, another factor of ten, and I can play four by four Go. Uh, and then I need two more factors of ten, and I can play five by five Go, right? And now I'm up to, you know, a computer, you know, that that's a, a kilometer long. Uh, just to play five by five go. And you know, and then I'm asking for you know a trillion dollars in funding to build a computer that can solve six by six go. But you know, so I could say, oh look, you know, these scaling laws show that as I keep building, uh, making the system bigger and more powerful, I'm solving more and more problems. I mean, yes, that's true, but you know where this is going, right? By the time you get to seven by seven or eight by eight go, you've covered the entire planet with a computer and you know you can't solve you know 19 by 19 go with this method so is that what's going on right are we going to hit a brick wall uh or is something else going on that as you make these systems bigger they're actually internally developing more powerful forms of learning and reasoning and we haven't the faintest idea because we don't know how they learn or how they reason uh, so it's purely a speculative bet, right? Um, and uh, we'll learn a lot from the next generation because, uh, you know, GPT-5, as it's called, we don't know actually what they're going to call it, but let's call it GPT-5, uh, will cost tens of billions of dollars in hardware uh, and, and a lot of electricity and so on to, to train. Um, and it will have pretty much used up all the text in the universe. Um, already for GPT-4, the publicly available text was not nearly enough, so they had to go out and buy lots of privately held text in order to train it. Um, but by GPT-5, you know, that's it. There is no more. Um, and so I think if if they don't achieve 
AGI with GBD5, uh, then, uh, then that particular direction has probably come to an end. Uh, but I think some, some groups realize this, uh, both within OpenAI and in Google DeepMind. Uh, if you talk to Demis Asabis, who runs Google DeepMind, he will tell you, absolutely, we need more breakthroughs. Uh, and you know, he uses reasoning and planning as examples of things that large language models are just not very good at. Uh, and for reasons that are very clear, um, technically, uh, large language models cannot sit and think about the answer to a question. The, in, the input goes in and it's processed in a feed forward circuit and comes out the other end. And it cannot take any more time than that uh, to think. And so it cannot solve hard problems uh, unless you somehow get it to output its intermediate thoughts and then run it again and output some more intermediate thoughts and then run it again. So that's one direction people are taking is sort of wrapping a reasoning loop around a large language model and causing it to output its intermediate results uh, so that uh, it ends up solving the problem you know, with a million iterations of input and output rather than just one iteration. Um, but then we're back in the same situation we always have been in AI, which is that uh, you know, playing chess is difficult and you have to think very hard and come up with very intelligent uh, methods and algorithms and a lot of mathematical depth uh, in order to produce systems that uh, successfully solve really difficult problems. Um, mm. so we'll see whether uh, with the resources they have, they're able to make more progress. Yeah. Ah, thank you. So I wanted to take you uh, closer to, to uh, one of the jobs here at the central bank, which is to uh, uh, ensure financial stability here in Europe and keep the bank safe. Um, and a series of questions around this this topic. So, you know, what do you see are the, the main ethical and regulatory challenges associated with the use of AI in the financial sector? Um, if indeed all these financial institutions are going to build their own AGI models with with these perverse incentives, the way you lay them out, um, mm. you know what does this mean for for a regulator or a supervisor like like a central bank? Um, basically, do you have any hands how to approach this this problem from a regulatory perspective? Um. So, I mean, there are many, many applications of AI in the financial sector. And some of them are pretty mundane. You know, lending has been done, or so, at least some forms of lending have been done using AI since the 1960s. Um, and of all the sectors, it probably has the most experience with how do you ensure that lending decisions are not biased, uh, that the you know, deniable a denial should be explainable. And uh, maybe you can even fix your financial situation so that you can be approved for a loan. Uh, so that I think is reasonably well in hand. We've already seen, so trading systems um, have already caused market collapses. Um, there was a, an episode, I think it was 2011, if I remember correctly, where um, the algorithms got into some kind of doom loop and uh, wiped out more than a trillion dollars in value in about 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, since then we have put in circuit breakers, but we don't understand the dynamics of what happens. And these, these price deviations continue to occur, um, mostly confined to one or a small group of stocks. But again, we see, you know, in, in the space of now milliseconds, uh, you know, I, collapses or explosions in price uh, for, for particular securities um, that, again, are totally unexplained uh, and just have to do with algorithms that are interacting with each other in weird ways. Um, but I think in the long run, you know, I, as we build in 
uh, more and more capabilities and we turn over more sort of management decisions to AI systems, we're going to face this problem of how do we specify the objectives. Um, and it, when you have many such systems interacting, you know, at, at microsecond or nanosecond timescales, uh, it's extraordinarily hard to predict the the consequences of that, uh, especially when the systems are reasoning about each other uh, in a game theoretic way. So, um, so I, I think we have to be very careful. And a lot of people think that the the likely way in which this all comes undone is not, you know, an AI system takes over the world and makes human beings extinct. That's one. There, there are many such scenarios, but but it's a sort of a systemic collapse scenario where um, where our our information ecosystem or economic systems, uh, as we turn over more control to AI systems, um, they simply malfunction uh, in a way that causes an unraveling of our highly inter interdependent economic structures. Uh, so I I think if I was a, if I was a central banker, I would, I would much prefer that AI be used to do modeling and forecasting, which I think can we can do a great job, particularly with some of the uh, the parabolic programming tools um, that I mentioned. Where, and the advantage of those tools is we we can put in what we know. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's an enormous amount that we know about the structure of the economy. We know. You know, what are all the firms? We know where people live. We know what they do. We know how they move around. We can put all that knowledge in, uh, in, in these modeling formalisms um, and, and then collect all the data and update with respect to all the data and so on. Um, yeah. So, you know, whereas just saying, okay, we want, we want to maximize, we, we, we want to keep, uh, inflation below 2% and then turn over the management of the global economy to an AI system. Uh, you know, there are many ways of getting inflation below 2%, including wiping out all the people. Right? Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones here, who are calling here. inflation. Don't, don't want to go there. Um, we started a bit late, so uh, if okay with you, I would um, ask you two more questions. Um, one was triggered by uh, the quote, your quote of, of Sam Altman. Um, the question is, is it a good idea the way we're proceeding in Europe, which is we first introduced this European AI Act, which seems to have the goal to make AI developments, first of all, safe. Um, some have commented this may constrain innovation and technological progress. Um, more broadly, there seem to be very different um, approach uh, across the Atlantic between the US and, and Europe in terms of how much technological progress there is and development, um, but also the regulatory approach. Um, any any views on what is a sensible way forward and how should Europe react to that? Um, there's a lot of concern here of basically falling behind. Yeah, but uh, I mean, Europe fell behind Mm -hmm. before the European AI Act uh, came to pass, right? And, and yeah. you know, at the same time, you know, Mistral and, and Aleph Alpha and other examples show that there's nothing intrinsically uh, difficult that would prevent European companies from, from doing this kind of stuff. Um, the problem is, is completely clear if you look at the amounts of venture capital uh, that are deployed, you know, it's like 50 times higher in the US. And that's a decision for European banks and investors to make. Uh, and it doesn't have to do with regulation. You know, and if you, if you talk to the EU uh, tech envoy, um, de Graf, I think his name is, he's, uh, he's here in San Francisco, uh, he'll give you many examples, like in, um, in the uh, in telecommunications, it's much more regulated in Europe, and yet it's much more advanced and much cheaper in Europe, right? Um, 
when you look at Airbus versus uh, Boeing, right, the regulators in the US relaxed their rules on Boeing. Uh, Boeing promptly killed 700 people uh, in two crashes of the 737 MAX and almost went out of business. So by not, re by not regulating and not following regulations, uh, they almost destroyed the American airline industry. So, so all the people who say uh, regulation stifles innovation, right? They're all flying to meetings on highly regulated airplanes. They're eating highly regulated food and they're using highly regulated internet to send emails to each other and post things about how terrible regulation is. Um, and it's true, the tech industry has been incredibly successful in avoiding regulation altogether. Um, both liability uh, and even just ordinary, uh, you know, guarantees that products do what they're supposed to do. Uh, if you read the Microsoft Windows license, it says Windows doesn't do anything. Uh, Windows is entitled to steal all your data and send it to Microsoft um, or to your competitors, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? And they get away with it because they have very expensive lobbyists who've been very successful. Uh, so I just don't buy this argument at all. Um, we have to, you know, as we do in medicines, right? We have to say, yeah, you can innovate as much as you want, but before you put it in the market, you have to show that it's not gonna kill people, mm -hmm. right? And so there are things we don't want AI systems to do and we should say, yeah, you can innovate as much as you want, but before you put it in the market, show that your system is not going to do those things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, my last question is um, as follows. So you, you said, uh, I quite like this, that the way you put that, that you know, the economics profession is finally waking up to some of these uh, uh, developments. And, uh, and also here at the ECB, we are increasingly pursuing analytical work, be it in the forecasting, uh, financial stability areas. Um, so so what kind of practical advice do you have for, for researchers in AI that are sort of new to the field coming maybe from, uh, let's say, econometrics background, or maybe more generally, what, what advice do you have for your own students uh, when they're interested in pursuing research in the AI? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a real dilemma that I face because a lot of my students naturally want to get hired by the big labs. Yeah. Um, one of my students is entertaining offers from the three big labs right now that average 1.5 million per year. Um, so, uh, you know, and to get those offers, you need to know how to operate, you know, build and operate and improve large language models because that's the technology that everyone is excited about. But um, I think uh, it's very hard to do research in that area. Uh, and one reason is that you need, you know, $10 billion worth of hardware, and uh, you can only find that in a few places. Um, so, but you can do research on smaller versions of the models and, and, and still get a pretty good idea of what's going on. But the problem is there's just no research to do, right? And the way, if it doesn't work, how do you fix it? You buy $100 billion worth of hardware. And that's just not very interesting from, from a research point of view. There's almost no underlying mathematics. You know, mm -hmm. gradient descent is, is, is all you really have to know. Um, and uh, um, there's, there's no depth of theory and there's no understanding of what's going on. Uh, I think one interesting direction actually is what we call mechanistic interpretability. So how do you uh, probe the internals of these systems in a systematic way um, to, to try to gain some understanding of what's going on um, or to, you know, or to fix them. But it, it turns out surprisingly that even though we don't understand what's going on inside, we can fix them. Right, so just one example, uh, you can fix a large language model so it thinks the Eiffel Tower is in Rome, 
<laughs> and so we've we've learned how to do that and then you know it consistently will act exactly as if the eiffel tower is in rome um because we've modified the internals of what you know after training but uh we still don't really understand what's going on so that's one interesting direction um uh, and it, it may end up being that we we have to treat these AI systems in the way we treat dogs and horses and to some extent humans, right? They're mysterious systems. They have functions and we've learned what their economic functions can be. And we've learned how to put them into systems so that they can carry out those functions successfully without messing up too much. Um, and, and so studying the economics of, of, of systems that are built out of those kinds of components um, could be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking it's with this LLM type of research, research it seems almost impossible to, to meet the new replicability standards that most journals are introducing and uh, so it seems very hard to publish that kind of research but anyway i i want to we've run a little over time i want to uh, thank you very much there's so much more to ask uh, thanks for whetting the appetite here and um, i want to thank everyone on the call for chipping in with questions um, and uh, professor russell you for for waking up so early and being so flexible and uh, looking for a new time to give this interesting talk um, it will be recorded and uh, it has been recorded, so uh, we will make sure that uh, other colleagues can also listen to it again if need be. So with that, uh, wish you all the best and um, we hope to welcome you at another opportunity uh, and another event here at the ECB later this year. Thank you very much. I hope to visit. Thank you very much and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Bye bye.